Hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about self-gravitation in the context of astrophysics and how we use it to define things. So uh, the idea of self-gravitation is important throughout the study of galactic astrophysics and indeed all of astrophysics. And today we want to formalize a little bit of the physics and the mathematics behind it. Uh, the really important thing that we have here in galaxies uh, is the idea that self-gravitation gives us a way of defining a thing in astrophysics in a physically meaningful sense. So I show two things here that uh, make up a galaxy. On one hand, you have a star, and you can say, oh, I'm pretty sure I understand what a star is and where I will find uh, stars. So uh, the star here is, you know, a self-contained entity, and you can talk about the inside and the outside defined with respect to the photosphere. But what really makes it into an object is the fact that it holds itself together through its own gravity. Uh, mass attracts the other mass in the star, holding it down in one place. Uh, in contrast, there's something like what's shown here on the right. That is a nebula. And while a nebula is a thing, at the edges it's very difficult to decide where a nebula ends and where the not nebula begins. So this is a bit of a philosophical point, but it is important because the tools of self-gravitation will allow us to define objects and furthermore interpret the behaviors of objects over the long term. So we need to develop a little bit of the physics behind that. And almost all of the gravitation that we'll worry about in this class is standard Newtonian gravitation. So we don't uh, sweat too much about general relativity here. Uh, and self-gravity is this wonderful framework for defining things, and we're going to use a form of the uh, gravitational law that looks like this. So this is, uh, this notation is kind of important. Uh, this is F sub 2, 1. So this is the force of gravity. And the notation we do use here is that when we see these uh, 2, 1 subscripts, this is the force of object 2 on object 1. Uh, and so what we've done is we have um, written down the magnitude of the force, g m1 m2 over r21 squared, and then we've given it a little unit vector to indicate the direction here. So r21 is the vector from object 2 to object 1, and then uh, m1 and m2 are the masses of these two objects. g is the constant of gravitation, and um, the inverse square law is something that we've probably seen before and are familiar with. And then the negative sign in this context indicates that the force is pointing backwards along the direction. So the vector goes from object 2 to object 1, and then the force of object 2 on object 1 pulls back along that vector, which makes sense. The force is attractive, so they are pulling the objects together into one place. So the next thing that we're going to look at is the gravitational potential energy. So this force has an associated gravitational potential of the form g m1 m2 over r21, not squared, 1 over r. It also has a negative sign on it, and it has a constant. This is the constant of integration associated with integrating this force to get a potential energy, and we don't actually worry too much about what the constant is, uh, because our convention in astrophysics is to take that constant to be zero. And what that means is that this whole gravitational energy tends towards zero as the separation r21 gets large. And you can see that as this value gets large, this fraction, the denominator, gets really big. Uh, and so that will tend it to zero, but it will be negative as it tends to zero. So when we bring things together, we get a negative gravitational potential energy. This is just a convention. Uh, the actual, uh, the only physical thing that a potential energy uh, it means is a difference in potentials. And when you consider a difference in potentials, these constants fall out. So we don't actually care about what the constant is. If we want to do physics, it's just that this convention makes our math easy and drops out a bunch of terms that we don't really uh, worry about or care about. Okay, so given that potential energy, we want to define the gravitational binding energy of an object. 
And so this is the energy, not considering a, you know, pairs or sets of objects, but really considering an object made of individual components. And we need to figure out how much energy it would take to pull that object apart uh, to infinity. So separate its constituent parts uh, into, uh, separate its constituent parts out uh, to infinity, how much energy would we have to put into the system to get to uh, get it infinitely part of, pulled apart? And we do that by calculating the potential energy of assembly uh, as these objects come together and brought together. And so I'd like to carry out that calculation for this object here. It's just a triangle, equilateral triangle made of three masses, m1, m2, m3, and they are separated by a side length s. Now, when we calculate the assembly, we imagine first bringing in mass one, then bringing in mass two, and then bringing in mass three. And so the self-gravitational energy uh, from bringing in mass one, u sub g, for mass one is going to be zero. It just shows up there. It's not interacting with anything. There's no associated gravitational potential energy from bringing it in. However, when I bring in the second mass, ug, 2, I get the gravitational binding energy from the first uh, mass being uh, connected to the second mass by the force of gravitation, and I get the energy out. And then when I configure it into these two positions with m1 and m2 separated by a distance s, what I get is uh, that I, that gives me a contribution of energy, g, m1, m2, divided by s. Finally, I want to bring in the gravitational energy for source 3, or for mass 3. And when I bring that in, it comes in and then it joins the other three in this nice equilateral triangle. But when it comes in, it has a gravitational interaction with mass 1 and also with mass 2. And so what that means is that we get a gravitational contribution g, m1, m3, divided by s, and we also get a gravitational contribution from interacting with mass uh, 2. So we get g m2 m3 divided by s. Oops, I've had two negative signs in there. That one too. Uh, so that's m3. And so the total gravitational energy of this system is uh, the term from uh, basically the sum of all three of these. And so we add them up and we get that the total gravitational binding energy for the system is negative g over s. I'm going to factor that out of all three terms. m1, m2, that's the first term up there, uh, uh, plus m1, m3, plus m2, m3. So that's kind of a neat little pattern is that even though we had nothing from the first term, we end up kind of catching up in terms of interactions. So we get every possible mass interacting with every other mass in the system, and that makes a contribution to the gravitational binding energy. Now, as we look at uh, other more extended objects, we have to see that sort of same kind of physics that we see for individual point masses here played out for an extended body. So the uh, next thing that we'll consider is a binding energy of a spherically symmetric mass. And this is my sort of poor sketch of a spherical mass. And uh, in this case, we're gonna consider this to have a mass density distribution of the form rho, of r is going to have some function of r and so it's going to be a mass density uh, represented uh, at separation from the center. Uh, I could also write this as the sort of scale variable s as we uh, see it here and this object is going to have mass total big M and total radius uh, big R. And so we'll use R and S uh, as variables inside the sphere, 
and then big M and big R are going to be the total object. Now I don't know what this mass density is going to be. It can be any fu functional form. We're going to assume it's spherically symmetric, so there's no angular like latitude or longitude coordinates uh, in this. It's just a one-dimensional function, and we want to calculate up what its binding energy is. And uh, this is essentially, it looks, it may look bad, but it is exactly what we did before. Uh, so what we do is we consider the contribution from bringing in a single thin spherical shell of mass of radius s and thickness ds. So there's radius s, thickness ds. I can even bring it back and show it to you on big screen. Uh, and we're bringing that in, and we're going to consider its contribution adding up all uh, from falling down on top of all the mass that's already there. And so that's basically the mass in this interior section there. So inside that mass is the mass uh, up to that radius. And we consider the contribution to binding energy from that thin spherical shell to be G times the M of R. And so that's the mass that goes out to a radius r, little r divided by the tiny little bit of mass dm and uh, divided by uh, 1 over r, which is the size of whatever shell we're dropping it onto. Now, you might ask, what is the mass of a thin spherical shell like this? So what is the mass of that object? Well, it's a sphere, so we say, okay, the little bit of mass in that uh, thin spherical shell is going to be dm is going to be the surface area of a thin spherical shell. So that's going to be 4 pi. As I've drawn it here, I'm going to call it s squared. So surface area of sphere is 4 pi r squared. This radius will be s. So that's uh, 4 pi s squared. And then it's going to basically be the thickness of that. So it's essentially, if we flattened it all out, this would be basically a height uh, of the volume. So it's the third dimension. So I call that ds. And then this entire term here is the volume of that thin spherical shell. And if I know the thin spherical shell, I can then multiply it by the mass density rho of s. And that's the total mass. So mass times volume is the little bit of mass in that shell. Critically, we assume that the shell is thin enough First off, that this variable uh, functional form for the volume holds. Uh, and then we also assume that the rho sub s is constant in the shell. That's uh, the key point. So constant in the shell. Uh, and that gets us the ability to really uh, do some calculus uh, on this. But that thin, uh, that thin shell approximation means that we can treat that as the constant and use this form for the integral. So this little bit of dm is uh, the volume of the shell times its mass density. But the mass inside the shell, this region here where we're falling down onto, has already been built up from a bunch of thin spherical shells. And so we can actually figure out how much mass is already there uh, in there. So if I was going to consider, uh, I consider that a variable, I call that m of r. So it's basically the mass interior to a radius r in a uh, sphere. And that is the integral of the masses of the shells up to that radius. So if I was considering the whole object, I would integrate out to a big radius of big r. And so my uh, integral would be 4 pi s squared times rho of s times ds. So that would be uh, that would get me a uh, that would get me the thin spherical shell built up to give me uh, the total mass of the object, and so we now know all of the terms inside this little differential gravitational binding energy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate that from zero to m. Basically, say all right, start with bringing in a thin spherical shell when there's nothing there, and then drop something, a thin shell on top of that, and that's going to give me a contribution of this uh, magnitude. And then we're going to build up larger and larger uh, parts of mass, and so the m of r will be increasing, and my thin spherical shells will be uh, coming in and dropping onto it. And so that's going to give me a functional uh, integral that's going to look a little like this. So I can calculate the total gravitational energy from the energy from every shell dropping onto it. And uh, from there, I can uh, 
go ahead and write this m of r as a uh, sum of the spherical shells up to that point. So that's integral zero to r of a dummy variable, s, which is why I introduced s earlier, 4 pi s squared rho of s. So whenever I give you a problem that looks like calculate the gravitational binding energy of a object, this is the integral you go to. It kind of looks gory, uh, but it almost always follows the same pattern. And I'd like to sort of walk through the parts of it. First on sort of thinking about what the mass is, and then uh, thinking about how to turn that into the gravitational binding energy. So let's get started. Let's first calculate what m of r is for an object with a uniform density. So I'm going to do the easy one and let you all have some fun with calculus on the, uh, let's say, more interesting ones. So this just means that this solid sphere has a mass density of rho. And you could look at this answer and you say, OK, well, what's the ma total mass of this object if it has a uniform density? And we'll call that, for our purposes, let's give it a variable name rho naught. And then you can just say, well, the mass of the total object is going to be the density times the volume, and it's a shell or it's a sphere of radius big R. And I, I've learned calculus. I know that that's 4 thirds pi big R cubed times rho naught. So that gives me the mass of the object. And I just want to show you that the relationship we're going to use is going to do the exact same thing. Uh, so m of r is this uh, integral here. And what I can do is I can plug in this rho uh, naught for a function of s. And so the non-trivial uh, kinds of approaches uh, take this to be an interesting function for rho of s. But what we're going to do is we're just going to add up, okay, we're going to say that this is m of r is equal from integral of 0 to r 4 pi s squared rho naught times ds. And then I'm going to pull out all my constants just to keep things neat. And we'll go integral 0 to r uh, s squared ds. And so that's an integral that I can do, 4 pi rho naught. Uh, and that goes to s cubed over 3 evaluated at 0 and r. And then we write that as 4 pi rho naught times r cubed over 3 uh, minus 0, because it's 0. And that gets us back to exactly what we were hoping for, 4 pi r cubed over 3 times rho naught. So that makes sense. And notice that this is, I actually calculated two slightly different things. The thing up here is the mass of the whole sphere, and then the mass here is the mass interior to radius r. They have the same object, uh, same form, just because it's a uniform density object. And if you think about that, that means that when I'm thinking about this graph, as I'm building up the radius, uh, if uh, I, I look at R and I look at M of R, then the variable, the curve follows a cubic where this is uh, a R cubed. It's proportional to R cubed until we reach the total mass of the object. So 4 thirds pi big R cubed rho naught at a radius of r, but I can always look at this function earlier in the graph or inside, um, and that would give me the mass at some radius s. So, or let's call it little r to be consistent in notation. Little r, and then the mass here is 4 thirds pi little r cubed rho naught. Okay. So I'm really belaboring a point here just because I want to sort of set up the sort of structure for thinking about this and uh, show you sort of how to carry out these nested integrals. And if we look back, what we have done is we're, if we're calculating the gravitational binding energy of this object, we've done this part. We have a functional form for that. And so what I can do is then count, uh, substitute that value in here for calculating what big ug is. So u sub g is negative integral 0 to r of 4 pi r uh, times g. And rho, I'm going to just write as the constant, rho of r, rho naught, 
dr, and then I'm going to multiply that by my expression for the volume, uh, or for the mass interior to radius uh, little r, uh, 4 thirds pi, little r cubed, uh, there's a row naught again, and hey, we're done. Okay, so then this is an integral we can also do. In fact, to, again, keep things kind of neat and tidy, I'm going to pull out all my constants. So I get a minus 16 pi squared, and then I've got a uh, over, looks like we've got a 3, we have a g, we have two rows, row naught squared, and then what's left inside is the integral from 0 to r of 1 power of r here and 3 powers here, so that's r to the 4th dr. And that integral will, of course, reduce to minus 16 pi squared over 3 g rho naught squared r to the fifth over 5. Okay, so formally we're finished, but this isn't the most illuminating expression algebraically. And what I want to do is kind of massage things around using the relationship that we have of um, to define the mass of the total object. So as we'll recall that the mass of the object is 4 pi over 3 big R cubed times rho naught. And what I'd like to do is identify that inside this algebraic mess. And so the first thing I'm going to do, kind of knowing the direction this is going, is to multiply the top and the bottom by R. And so what I'll do then is I get a, um, I'll, I'll pull this out. Oh, and I think I'll need, yeah, well, let's do that a little later. So then we end up with row knots, well, let's, let's write this as minus G, and I'll put that one of those R's down here, minus G over R times uh, 16 pi squared, over 3, I'm going to pull the 5 out front again because I kind of know where this is going. Uh, and then we have a row naught squared times r to the 6th. So that's r to the 5th plus 1 is r to the 6th. Uh, and that kind of covers all of my bases. And what I'll see is that if I square this, I'll get to here with one exception, which is I need to multiply and divide by a factor of 3. Okay, now we're set. So we might got minus 3g over 5r times, uh, let's see here, that's 16 pi squared over 9 rho naught squared r to the 6. And then I can see that that's minus 3g over, to g, 5r times 4 pi over 3 rho naught r cubed quantity squared, and so that's minus 3 fifths g m squared over r. And I love this form for this expression because this looks exactly like g m1 m2 over r, and then there's just a number out front. And that number out front is this dimensionless form factor that depends on the mass distribution. So it's really kind of nifty. This looks just like Newtonian gravitation, g m1 m2 over r, potential energy of the whole system. Notice it's m squared, though. And that's because all of the mass is interacting with all of the other mass. And that three-fifths basically tells you, on average, how far apart is everything if I was going to carry out that integral to kind of add up the little bits of uh, mass uh, together here. Uh, and so uh, it, it basically carries out this whole um, calculation for us, which is really a phenomenal uh, result. So this is... Um, quite a neat little bit of gravitational wizardry. And we'll always get an answer that looks like g m squared over r, uh, and then there'll be a number out front. And it might be 3 pi over 4, it might be 2, it could be any kind of uh, uh, number, but everything goes with g m squared over r. And so if we estimate the binding energy of an object, we'll often just write down g m squared over r as the binding energy with a negative out front, and then put you know, some factor in there later when we do all the calculus. Okay, so 
That was a long kind of derivation of how to do this calculation of whether an object is self-gravitating or not. And so what we want to figure out is, uh, well, if we know how to calculate the gravitational binding energy, to answer whether it's uh, self-gravitating, we just have to ask whether the total energy of the system is zero. So gravitational binding energy, always negative by our convention. We could add a constant on it, but we're not going to. Uh, then we consider the total energy of the system, and almost always the important energy term uh, that we can compare that to is the kinetic energy, so the one-half mv squared for all of the objects in the system, uh, etc. So what we'll say is that an object is self-gravitating if this total, gravitational plus kinetic, is less than zero. And so that would imply, if it's less than zero, that the binding energy is larger than the kinetic energy. And so self-gravity will keep this object together on average. Now, this doesn't mean, like, if I have a star cluster that's self-gravitating, that every star will always stay attached. Those particles in a star cluster, sorry, the stars, uh, can exchange energy, and one object can lose energy, and another object can gain energy and get thrown out of the star cluster. So, on average, the whole system will stay together, but individual parts of it may not. So, we'll study this so much more when we get into dynamics, but for right now, the important thing is that when we balance the uh, these two, or when we add these two terms together, if it's less than zero, that gives us a self-gravitating object. And remember, the reason why we're doing this is this is a way that we define a physically meaningful object. Is it self-gravitating? So that is what I want to say about self-gravity.